right. Thank you so much for, for having this paper in the program. Um, in this paper, we'll try to examine the relationship between the state, uh, the, the state and the data intensive innovations. In particular, we'll try to understand the ways in which the state can shape the direction and, uh, and the growth uh, in the data intensive economies. Okay, so this is joint work with Martin Baraha from MIT and uh, Noam Yukman from LSE. So when I started thinking about AI innovation broadly, uh, and uh, sort of AI meaning artificial uh, intelligence, I mean, these technology has been increasingly widespread around the world. And economists and social science broadly has been spent a lot of time trying to think about how this, uh, this technology has a potential to, and, and oftentimes has already realized its potential to shape the modern world, um, in, in, including the economies and, and the society at large. A defining feature of AI technology and AI in, uh, and innovation in AI technology sector is that the AI innovation is data intensive. And by data intensive, what we mean is that in addition to algorithm, algorithmistic advances, the availability of data has played a very important role in determining the rate of the progress in the, in the sector, especially since the deep learning revolution uh, after 2012. Now take a couple of examples that's, that's very prominent in the, in, the, in the recent decade. Think about advances in fish recognition, AI speech recognition, the chess mastery, and AI translation. All these are advances in AI technology that are made upon decade-old algorithms but applied to newly collected large set of data. So in addition to sort of the accumulation of algorithm knowledge and so on, the additional in, uh, sort of availability of data has been sort of playing a very critical role in shaping technology uh, advancements in the sector. Now in this paper, we'll try to argue and hopefully convince you that innovations and growth in data intensive economies may be crucially shaped by the state. And this is for two reasons. In particular, it's because the, it, because the data intensive economy data is an input into that economy, data as that input differs in two very important ways uh, from the traditional inputs that we know of. A traditional input thinking about sort of capital or human capital. The first difference is that states are oftentimes the key collectors and repositories of data. And this has been true throughout history and, all, and certainly true up until today. The state has been collecting massive amount of, amount of data to, to fulfill their primary objective as the, as the, as the governing uh, body. It ranges from sort of administrative data that makes the society more eligible so that state can tax citizens to civilian state that, that, that uh, the state collects to provide public security uh, to geographic and scientific data that uh, the state collected to, to use for national defenses and so on. Okay, so very interestingly, the root of the word statistics is actually state. So we have been thinking for a long time that, that the state has, has been playing a role in collecting uh, data and information in the society. A second defining feature of data as, uh, that, that different, uh, differs from the traditional input is that data can be shared across multiple uses simultaneously within a firm. So then when, the, when these two sort of features combined, it gave rise to the potential of economies of scope that could arise from the, the government data. So thinking about sort of a, a AI firm that gained access to data the government has been collecting the AI firm can use the data to produce things that are potentially sort of helpful for the government. And at the same time, the AI firm can use the exact same data without any additional crowding out of resources and so on to use the data to, 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 to produce for the commercial uses that the government may not directly care about. Because okay, so that sort of sharing, uh, the ability to share the uses uh, of data across the firms and the, the data being initially sort of oftentimes collected in large quantity by the state uh, is going to potentially give rise uh, to, this, uh, to, the, to the economy of scope. And we're going to argue that the, the potential existence of the economy of scope is going to have important implications for the direction of innovation in the sector. Okay? So in this paper, we want to ask three, uh, three questions. The first question was asked, do we actually see economies of scope uh, sort of arising from government data empirically from sort of the, at, at the micro level, at the firm level. Okay, to do that, we're gonna empirically study a prototypical sector in which state could play an important role and state has a particular interest. And I'm gonna focus on the fish recognition industry, AI industry in China. And then show you a, a direct evidence that the economy of scope uh, do seem to arise uh, from government data. Now, just having economy scope arising at the micro level, at the firm level, it's not immediately uh, sort of uh, obvious that this will aggregate up to the macro level. 
So it's so the second question I want to ask in this paper is that do we actually see this aggregation and what are the and, 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 and relatedly what are the macro implications of government data provision to firms? If there are economy of scope arising from government data at the firm level, do we actually see this broadly across the entire economy? So to do that, I'm going to show you a and we're going to build a direct technical change model where we explicitly have data as an input uh, in the economy. I'm going to build it in. Uh, the, the potential for economy of scope. And I'm going to use this framework to understand sort of the macro implication of, uh, of government providing data to the firm across the board. Okay. And towards the end of the talk, hopefully I'll have some time to, to talk through uh, three applications, which, which will be useful to, to, uh, to, to illustrate the varied roles in which the state can affect uh, the data intensive innovation. And then this is going to borrow uh, the, the empirical estimates of economy of scope uh, magnitude that, the, that we can get from the, uh, from the empirical setting. So I'm going to go through a couple of uh, the applications of uh, the state setting industrial policy, the state choosing the level of civilians on its citizens, and the state's choices of regulation to, to, to respect citizens' privacy concerns. And then I'm going to think through all these and how they can affect the, 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 uh, the growth and the direction of the data intensive innovation. Okay. So, so first, I'm going to start focusing on the micro level. Do we actually see evidence of economies of scope arising from government data? Now, I, I don't think I need to aim for this audience to convince you that much. So, facial recognition AI industry is a particularly interesting industry to study for, for this question. It's a prototypical setting in which the role of the state uh, could play uh, could, could be important uh, in in a data intensive uh, sector. Uh, this is for two reasons. First is that so developing facial recognition software is actually very data intensive. It requires access to large amounts of data. And many of the algorithm that's used in the cutting edge facial recognition sort of technology has already existed since the late 90s. Uh, but it's, but the, the real recent advances has, has been sort of the large accumulation of data in the last five or, or uh, five years or so. Okay. The Chinese government and various units of, within the Chinese government has been collecting large amount of data precisely in the nature of uh, sort of individual faces uh, and, and video streams that's allowed sort of firms to train their algorithms on that data. The, 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 the sort of the, the individual identities in this data are identifiable uh, and which is going to be a super valuable sort of source of uh, raw input into the facial recognition industry. Okay, so I'm going to broadly walk you through sort of the, the mechanisms uh, we, we had in mind, and we, we formalized this in a, a, in, in a simple model, uh, sort of partial equilibrium model in the, in, the, in the paper. But let me just talk you through uh, in, in words. Okay, now, now the first is when to think about a firm, an AI firm that received a government procurement contract. These firms is not sort of, uh, the, the, the government is sort of uh, asking various private firms to, 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 to set up AI algorithms or AI machineries uh, for its public security units. Firms receive such procurement contracts. Uh, and, and by definition, as these AI firms are, are, are sort of producing such AI algorithms to processing data, the firms will uh, hence receive access to government's data uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a process for providing uh, such services. We're thinking about sort of these AI firms after the procurement contract has been set up, uh, will then uh, will process sort of uh, uh, facial data from video streams uh, for, for the local police department that's been collected from the street cameras. And th then these video streams oftentimes have labeled personal images from the police department's sort of uh, personal ID systems. And, and that will be the data sort of the firms have access to. It has access to because it's the, oftentimes the AI firms is, is meant to process the data for the local police department. Now, importantly, once the, the AI firm had access to those police department collected data, it can use the data to develop the software the government wanted or the procured for, which is sort of potentially the civilian's uh, data software for the, for, the, for the government. But the same data set can then be used to produce things for the commercial market that government may not have direct interest in. We think about the, if the firm would use the data to train an algorithm to detect individual faces from video streams. And then the data and the algorithms can then be used to, to, to train potentially other, uh, the other algorithms or sort of fine tune the algorithm that can, that can be helpful to detect shoppers uh, from a video stream from a, from a retailer, uh, uh, which is going to have a lot of commercial uh, market value uh, because it, it allow the firms to do, uh, the retailers to do sort of individual or personalized advertising and so on. Okay, so that's going to be the chain uh, that we try to sort of empirically identify. 
uh, and see whether we, we see this sort of spillover uh, in from production and innovation that's not only producing uh, government software, but also commercial software, which, which will be the direct hint uh, on economies of scope. Okay. So to empirically identify this, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of, uh, actually before I talk about the empirical challenge, let me sort of emphasize, there's a, there's a conceptual ambiguity that the economy of scope may not necessarily arise even if data is shared across users. But think about the traditional model where if a firm gets a large government contract to produce government software uh, for the state, it could very well crowd out resources that firm is going to use to produce anything else because it just gets a big customer and it's going to reallocate all these other resources and intermediary goods to produce for, for, for the government software. And it's going to crowd out production of the commercial software, uh, which, which means that at the firm level, we may not actually see uh, uh, economies of scope. Okay, so, so that's the thing we're going to, we, we'll try to test and we'll try to examine. Now, to empirically look at this, there's, a, there's, a, there's three major uh, empirical challenges, which, which essentially that we need to have access to three different sets of data to be able to sort of paint the story that I, I just described to you. Now, so the first data set we will need is that we need to have a data set that linked each AI firms in China, each AI official recognition firms to their relationship and their, their interaction with the government and the contract they receive from the government. And that data set did not exist uh, uh, before. The second data set we need is we need to look at, we need to know something about these AI firms uh, output. And, and for these sort of AI uh, facial recognition firms, it's mostly sort of going to be software output. That oftentimes do not exist. And in particular, critical for our sort of uh, framework, not only do we need to know the overall total count of the software, we need to know the categories of the software, in particular by the usage. Uh, we'll need to know whether the software that the, the AI firms are producing is for government uses or it's for commercial uses. And that also does not exist before. The third data set we need is that we, would, which is going to be a, a typical challenge for, for empirical study on, on data intensive sector is that we don't directly observe firms access and usage of data. Uh, so for example, we don't directly see the firm's server usage and so on to look at how much data they actually have. So we need to have some proxy to, 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 to be able to quantify the amount of data the firm had access to uh, through the government contract. Okay, so, so these are the three data sets that we, 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 we need to have and, and then we'll try to build from scratch uh, for this project. Uh, sort of then we have two sort of empirical identification challenges that's more or less standard. Uh, the, the first one is that of course the, the firm's receiving of government contracts uh, by, by providing services for the government is not gonna be randomly assigned. So we need to find empirical strategy uh, to deal with this non-random assignment. And also by receiving contracts, you know, contracts might provide the firm with, with many other things in addition to data. Uh, contracts gonna provide firm with capital, but contracts can provide firm with signal uh, about their ability uh, to, to innovate and so on, which can have commercial value. We need to sort of uh, hopefully tease out all these other mechanisms and see that it's at least a big part of the story here is the, is the data access that come with a contract. Okay, so let me quickly go through sort of the three data sets that we build together for this project that, that, that uh, try to solve the, the, the three uh, data challenges that I just described to you. The first data set that we, we built is a data set that linked all the AI firms in China to the government contract that these firms have received in its, uh, in its, in its uh, life cycle. Uh, so, so that comes in three different steps. The first one is we, we need to identify all the facial recognition AI firms that has ever existed in China. Uh, and many of these firms sort of uh, still exist, so they're not actually much bankrupt in, in this industry. Uh, part of the reason this is this fairly young industry. So overall, we had about we identified about sort of 8,000 firms in this industry that has sort of uh, doing some production uh, that, that, that involve facial recognition AI. Uh, and we, do, uh, we identify these 8,000 firms from two different sources. One is a China-based source, the Tay and Chad database, and also uh, we uh, complement that with, uh, with a US-based database, the Pitchfork. Okay, so these firms are, you know, some of them, many of them are, are specialized in facial recognition AI. Some of them are hardware companies such as Hitch Vision uh, that, that started with hardware and then later on sort of uh, specialized in, in AI uh, innovation. Uh, and some of them are gonna be sort of AI sort of subunit within a large conglomerate such as Baidu AI who do a lot of facial recognition. 
Okay, but but for those for those uh, subunits, we we only focus on their output uh, uh, at, at at the subsidiary level, but not sort of for example Baidu as a whole, and that's a very small share of these eight thousand firms. Okay, so that's on the firm side, and then we have we we, we we sort of identify a separate data source which is sort of quite close to the universe of all the government contracts, uh, the procurement contracts the Chinese government has been given out since the two, uh, since two thousand twelve. And these are about sort of three million of them, and these are officially registered uh, with the with uh, as the Chinese government procurement database uh, maintained by the Ministry of Finance. Okay, uh, so so then we just link link these to the data sets, linking government's buyer for uh, uh, for the for the government contracts uh, and and sort of all the suppliers uh, that, that that we identify as one of those uh, sort of uh, a thousand AI. So that's the first data set. The second data set that we need to construct is that we need to look at what is the output that these AI firms are, are, are putting out. Uh, so for a, given that they're mostly software firms, uh, not doesn't have to, sort of much of the hardware production, uh, we're gonna focus on the software output. And these software output in, in China needs to be registered with the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology. Uh, new releases of software or major updates of software needs to be registered there. So we sort of essentially get the full list of the software uh, that's ever registered in that database and then link that to the AI uh, firm uh, data set. We don't have sort of, for, for most of the firm, we didn't have a, a, a validation uh, of how complete that is. But for one case, we actually do. MACV is one of the first uh, or the first uh, facial recognition AI firm has ever gone public. Uh, so for for the MACV's uh, IPO pro uh, prospectus, we can look at sort of the software that MACV themselves uh, sort of listed, and we actually sort of do see 100% of the software are covered and registered with the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology. And we take that as a, as a very good signal that, uh, that our, our coverage of the software production is, is going to be very complete. As I mentioned, just having the total count of software is not enough for us to identify the potential existence of economy of scope. We need to look at whether the softwares are, are produced intended for government uses and whether the software are, are produced intended for commercial uses. So, to, to, so, so we're going we're gonna to try to categorize that. Uh, so, for example, for the government uses software, we're going we're gonna to take example for this is a real software, smart city real time monitoring system on main traffic routes. Sort of you know, language and description like this make us think that this is software potentially sort of the intended user is the, is the government. Now, a, a software uh, has the that has the description of visual recognition system for smart retail is likely to be a software that government don't care about, but is for the commercial market. And that would be the language uh, that we're going to use to, to help us to identify the commercial uh, software uh, category. We're going to have a third residual category, which likely this is going to be software for general uses, uh, because we can't tell the particular customer from those software. It's like, for example, a synchronization method for multi-view camera based on FPGA uh, uh, chips. You know, this is software that uh, that's not sort of a customer specific. Uh, there's about a third of the software that's that's in this category uh, that we're hoping to tell whether it's specifically government or commercial. Okay. Of course, the, the, the software, uh, the amount of softwares that these A thousand firms are producing are too large to code by, by hand. So we use a, a, a recurrent neural network model to, 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 to train on about 13,000 manual labeled uh, software. And then we sort of then apply that this, this neural network model on the rest of the software. And our sort of prediction accuracy rate is uh, validated with the, with the manual label data set is very high. So 90% of the, of, of, of the, of the manually labeled uh, training data can be, can be sort of uh, um, uh, predicted correctly. So, David, okay. so this can, is our, can I, yeah. can I ask a question? Uh, so I think this is useful, very useful to kind of check one channel of crowding out you mentioned earlier. But you know, uh, I, I'm wondering if it's a, it's a, if there exists other indicators about you know productivity gain, uh, of those uh, those those guys who have access to government data. So, for instance, some of my data actually uh, came through the channel you just uh, you're talking about. Say that a guy you know got a contract with the government and uh, they got a data and then they develop some uh, you know products uh, database and selling uh, sold to us. But the problem is whether or not that that involves kind of productivity gain, or you know it's just based on kind of exclusive rights that they have to the government data. 
uh, to which other you know guys do not have. So, so one way to think about this is, is I'm, I'm not so sure if those are software producers, they, they, they file patents. Uh, one way to look at it is uh, to, to look at the number of patents they file. Say that uh, if, you know, by acquiring government data, they're able to uh, uh, advance the technology, not just kind of developing products based on exclusive rights to, to government data. Yeah. So, so one way to think point. about, yeah. you know, government data is, is, uh, is kind of... Uh, TFP or, or import. Another way to think about it, it's almost like a government subsidy. You know, they 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 kind of one way or another pick up a few uh, firms uh, uh, they would like to pick up and give them uh, exclusive rights. So in a way, that's a kind of uh, if the data is not uh, obtained in a competitive way, it's almost like it's another way of distortion, right? If, if right. it's right. so, so it'd be mm -hmm. useful at least to to check, you know, if they're other indicators about the uh, productivity gain. Yeah, so, so th three quick thoughts on, on, on your question. The first one is like sort of the, the, the conceptual sort of framework about thinking about government's provision of data and think that through almost as a way of subsidy or an alternative way of industrial policy, this is exactly where we're going for uh, towards the end. So, so, so I'll, I'll talk a lot more about that. The, the different alternative measurement uh, on, on sort of the firm's output now these are sort of you know, just concept of, of output, which doesn't have any quality uh, weight in, in that. So patents would try it at some point. Part of the sort of the the, the, the constraint there is that most of these firms don't file patents, uh, at least in the in the in the U.S. So just a very few sort of giants file patents in, in the U.S. So that's sort of going to be very thin, uh, thinly uh, concentrated. Uh, but what we do have though, and I, I I didn't put that in the slides today, is that there is a there's a kind of AI uh, fish recognition software that is considered by the data scientists as one of the highest quality and the most data intensive one, which is the AI fish recognition that involves video. And the, the, the sort of the rationale here is that to recognizing faces from a picture is fairly easy. Recognizing a, a, a person from a video stream is harder. Recognizing sort of two people from two video streams simultaneously is the hardest thing to do in a in a facial recognition AI industry, and that kind of software, which is called into a matching AI facial recognition software, that we can identify, and we can see whether firms are producing more of those. Which arguably one one unit of the video facial recognition software is going to be the hardest one to produce, and we see whether you're producing with more high quality ones. And that, that, that's so far our our, our only. Well, this is very useful. This is very yeah. useful. Right. So, so let me get back to the, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the data part. Uh, now, the third data set that we need to have uh, to be able to sort of fill in our story is that we need to have some measurement of firms access to data. And again, direct measurement of that is going to be very challenging. We don't see the firm server and so on. So we need to find proxies. So for this paper, we developed two proxies. Uh, uh, I'm going to describe to you uh, one by one at a time, and I'm going to focus on one of them uh, for, the, for the talk today. Uh, they're conceptually very similar. The first proxy is that we're gonna, we're gonna take advantage of, uh, under the intuition that if a firm had a fish recognition contract, a procurement contract with a local police department, that contract is gonna be more uh, data richer than a contract with a non-police department or non-public security units, uh, 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 but, but still public. I take this here as, a, as, a, as an example, these are two real contracts. The firm had had a contract with the Heilongjiang uh, Provincial Police Department in 2018 that the contract explicitly said the firms should be able to develop a system and access and analyze at least 30 million facial data. Now, police department, by definition, would have all, every resident's facial ID, and that's going to be a huge amount of data for the firms to have access to. A similar firm could have access to a, a, or, or established a, a, a facial recognition co uh, contract for a, a provincial uh, bank. Uh, this is this is a bank in Gansu, for example, uh, also in 2018, where it's trying to establish a facial uh, recognition identification system for the bank's clients. You know, bank's clients are not trivial amount of individuals, but but they're going to be a sort of a potentially a magnitude smaller than the local police department's uh, access to facial data. Okay. Now, of course, this is not going to be perfect because you know, per police contract versus non-police contract can differ by a wide uh, by by a lot of margins. So we're going to have a second proxy, which is going to look only within the police contracts, the other facial recognition, uh, the public security contracts. And we look at sort of the, the, within the police contracts, 
the ones that has uh, that are signed with a prefecture that that happen to have more or fewer advanced high resolution street cameras that the, the, the local police department has been building up until the date the the contract has been signed. So the way we're going to measure this is that we'll, for each of the prefectures in China, and each year we're going to look at all the procurement contracts that, that the particular local police department has been purchasing uh, and issuing to purchase street cameras and in particular high resolution street cameras that are AI capable. And then we're going to count all the street cameras that the, the, the local police department has been recently building up until the date when the firm has signed that, uh, the, that the AI firm has signed a particular contract. So importantly, the measurement of the local police department's uh, sort of camera capacity com is coming from their contract with non-AI firms. These are hardware firms that just providing cameras. I want to use the, the capacity of those cameras to, to, to use as a proxy for the amount of data that the, the subsequent AI firms will be able to have access to once AI firms sign a contract with that particular local police department. And this is going to be a time varying measure because every year the police department are purchasing new cameras. Okay. So now with that three sets of data, we can start doing something uh, to, 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 uh, to, to, to estimate and try to identify the economies of scope. So we're going to, in our baseline specification, I'm going to show you a estimates from a triple difference uh, specification where we compare the cumulative software releases of these AI fish recognition firms before and after these firms received their first data rich contracts relative to the data scarce contracts. And this the three layers of the, of, the, of the differences are, these are going to be within firm before and after the firm's first contract. So, 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 so the, they're always going to have firm fixed effects in there. And they also want to exploit that each firm is going to have their first contract signed at different time with local police department. So we're going to have calendar year, uh, calendar sort of season fixed effects uh, or calendar month fixed effects uh, there just to account for the, the generic sort of time trend. And, and, and some firms are going to have their first contract signed in 2017, first quarter. Some con uh, firms are going to have their first contract signed in 2017, first quarter. And the third difference is going to look at uh, the data rich contracts. Again, for, for example, the, 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 with the local police department that, that's, that's coming from a, 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 a very high camera dense uh, region versus a, a data scarce contract, which is a, with another police department that's coming from a, a relatively data uh, sort of uh, 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 less dense uh, region. Okay. And again, I'm going to only focus on the, on the, on the within, uh, within police department. Uh, high uh, versus low camera capacity as, as the main data uh, proxy for data richness today. But in the paper, uh, we're going to have the second proxy, which we can look at sort of the quote unquote extensive margin, look at the, the, the police contract versus the non police contract. Okay, so I'm going to show you a bunch of the graphs. Uh, uh, looking at again, looking at the outcome of, of, the, of the government data, uh, government software production, and the commercial software production. For data rich contracts, for data scarce contracts, and the difference between those two, uh, which is the, uh, the triple data. Okay. Now, uh, we're going we're gonna to sort of non parametrically estimate the, the time uh, indicator for each of the, 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 the SIMA year relative to the first SIMA year the firm had received the contract, which is, uh, which is the, the red uh, bar here. Okay, so from this graph, what you can see is that as soon as the firm has received its first data scarce contract, this is the left panel here, that firm has started to increase its production in software for the government. These are software sort of potentially just the, the, the procurement contracts are procuring for. And similarly, you see a pattern for the data rich contracts. So there's a flat sort of pre-trend before, no pre-trend before, and immediately at the first uh, summer year, uh, the, the firm started to produce more for the government. Now, but importantly, the third difference is what we think it, it, it's going to be most clean in terms of indication is that the increase in the firm's government software production for the data when it received the data rich contract is steeper across the board relative to the data scarce contract. So this is taking out just the sort of that any generic effect of working with a, with a police department. And, and this is sort of you know, identifying only all of the difference between the police department happen to have more cameras versus the police department doesn't have as much camera. Okay. Now, but, 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 but you know, the first panel on the firm's production or increased production in government software potentially is not going to be surprising because, again, these are precisely the, the, what the, the, the contracts are for. The firms better produce something for the government because it just won a large procurement contract uh, and a large client. 
So the direct sort of test for the existence of economy scope is going to see what happens to the to the to the commercial software that the government uh, are, are not interested in directly, and the procurement contract is not mentioned at all. And we see sort of a, a pattern very similar to the government contract, where as soon as the firm receive a data scarce contract, it starts to increase more of its production of the commercial software. And similarly for data rich contracts. But importantly, the increase in data rich contracts on the commercial software production is steeper across the board uh, relative to the data scarce one. And this is suggesting within the firm, the, 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 the evidence of economy scope that the firm seems to be getting an input, arguably the government data, uh, that the, the firms could use the exact same input simultaneously uh, to produce things, uh, to produce other uh, output that government don't directly care about. Okay. Now, I won't have too much time to, to, to talk through the auxiliary sort of evidence, but, but I want to show you a couple of direct evidence to say that some government data and actually the government data does seem to provide, uh, does still seem to play a big role here. The first um, almost yeah, the check is that- Can I ask yeah. a question? I mean, go back to that yeah. figure. Yeah. Last page. Mm -hmm. I mean, number one, the commercial differences don't seem very significant. And two, they don't seem bigger than the government differences. So. If there's a direct mapping, I make something for the government, then I just have the software. So I, I don't know how distinct these softwares are, but I mean, in other words, right. it could be related to the software for government is creating software for commercial, not the data is creating the software. Mm -hmm. So, so 2000, yeah, so, so, so 2000 on that one is that you actually wouldn't expect this crowding out to be sort of more than 100% in the sense that it's more natural to think that for each unit of government software, there generates some non-zero crowd out, but it's not going to, you're not going to produce more things for the government, uh, for the commercial market relative to how much you produce for the government uh, sector, because that's more direct than which, which you get in the contract for. So the quality here we see is that for every one unit of government software production increase over the course of the first three years, cumulatively, we see about uh, sort of uh, 6.6 unit of the commercial software production. Uh, so that's about sort of uh, two to two, uh, sort of two, uh, two to two uh, crowding out uh, effect, uh, sort of crowding in effect. Uh, the, the, the second, uh, the, uh, the comment you, you had is that so one way to think about, the, or one, a different way to ask your question is that here I'm, I'm trying to frame this as economies of scope coming from data. You can conceptually think equally about the economy, economy of scope arising from algorithm or, or improvement in algorithm. So it doesn't need to be literally you use the same data to produce something more uh, different. You could use the government data to, to fine tune your face recognition algorithm. Now that you, you have a better algorithm to de detect faces, that algorithm has economies of scope and you can use that improved algorithm to produce for the commercial market where before you need to have a, a face recognition algorithm that's, that's sufficiently accurate to be with the commercially viable. And now you do have that. And then hence you can start producing for the commercial market. So, so I'm mean, equally happy for, for, for interpretation where this is just the kind of scope pushing one level into the intermediary uh, at, the, at the algorithm level, but not the raw uh, data level. Uh, yeah. Can I ask okay. a question, sir? Oh, sorry. I just yep. wonder if you replace a data rich data per by the other, like if you replace it with capital rich capital per, could you show, is that helpful to show that they have very different patterns? Or so cap, capital rich meaning sort of how, how, how large is the, is the sort of the, the money tag coming from the contract? Yeah, because I just wonder whether can we, you know, how can we be yeah. more sure that this is about the data not yeah. many other things. Yeah. Right. So, so, yeah, so that's a great lead to, the, to what I was talking about next. But, well, first, I, for, I forgot to mention is that if you sort of stare very hard at, at this figure, this, this, uh, this sort of lighter shaded dots next to the darker shaded dots are the are specification coming out of controlling for all the sort of uh, contract characteristics interacting with the time indicator. So that including the contract sort of terms, contract uh, sort of money size and so on. And that's barely changed the, the, the coefficients here. And also in fact, the data rich contracts tend to be sort of uh, come with fewer uh, sort of uh, sort of revenue, revenue for the firm because part of the, the rationale here is that if the firm recognize how important those contracts are, uh, because the, those contracts are, are rich in data, the firms would potentially bid lower for those contracts to try to win it. 
and there are going to be more firms competing for those contracts also means that the, the, the end of winning sort of bids is going to be lower. That is actually exactly what we see. We see that the, with, even within the firm, they tend to submit lower bids for those data rich contracts. So those contracts actually come with fewer money. Uh, and, and there are more bidders for those contracts. So some firms certainly are strategic and, and sophisticated enough to understand those contracts are valuable. Okay. A second uh, David, sort of, I will think that, David, yeah. David, David, sorry, there's uh, also a chat box question. Could you take a look? Because, you know, it's kind of related to what Risha was asking. Yeah. They ask, you know, uh, asking about, you know, whether in the data rich uh, perfecture and data scarce perfecture, there's a uh, different trajectories for the, uh, for the AI for the AI industry development. Maybe you can briefly address it. And I, I'll leave the rest of the question for the general audience to the break. Mm -hmm. so, so part of the sort of the, we, we worry less about sort of the, the, the different sort of local trajectory is that every, the bulk of the notification is coming from within firm level. So these are within a particular firm right before and right after the firm's uh, contract level. So it has to be that that particular local government or local AI sector is increasing Sort of tremendously right at the time when it's giving out its first contract and in particular the firm could give uh, the local government could give out the second contract a month after and that we can use to identify a second firm and that doesn't sort of that can wash away a lot of the calendar uh, uh sort of a uh, year uh, uh calendar time uh sort of a uh, market tra trajectory which 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 is not the variation we're using to identify uh the, the effect okay so let me go back to to, to this slide uh, now, linking to, to also to Richard's question, a, a potentially more direct evidence uh, about sort of the firms actually are receiving a lot of data and data is playing a big role here. So we can look at one of the most direct intermediary goods, which is sort of software that is, that is not AI, but, uh, but data commentary. These are sort of, for example, software that helps the firm to store data, the software that helps firms to transmit data uh, in a more efficient manner. And these data commentary softwares are actually increased uh, in, in, in production, especially from the firm who received the, the data rich contract. So sort of almost a month after the firm has received the data rich contract, it start to produce software that, uh, that helps them store data. And that to us is, is, is very direct evidence that the firm probably received a unprecedented amount of data they didn't have access to before. Okay. The, the third one, which, which is what, what I mentioned to, 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 to Michael earlier, is that the, FIFA, the video facial recognition uh, is a particular data intensive. And those are the particular kind of software that's been increasing more for data rich contracts uh, recipients. Uh, and, and for the ones that's been producing video software for the government, which is probably because they have access to a, a large amount of uh, data to, be able to enable them to produce video software, its commercial software increases uh, is yet even more. That's about doubling the, the amount for a firm that produced some video software in the first quarter for the government. Okay. Uh, now, so due to time, I, I, I won't have time to go through sort of the various sort of alternative hypotheses uh, uh, that, that, that we, we, we will try to sort of, I wouldn't say rule out, but at least sort of try to, try to show evidence that it's not driving the bulk of the results here, learning by doing, signaling, uh, effect that, that, that the contract might have for the, for the individual firms to say how sort of commercially viable or political connection that particular firm has uh, and, and access to particular large market uh, through the contracts. And, 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 and we can do various checks to, 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 to try to uh, use those out. Okay. I do want to spend the last five minutes. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. No. Yeah, if you, let me just quickly to check, you know, if, uh, if there is any evidence on selection of firms say that if a firm uh, gets uh, uh, contracted, it's much more likely for that firm to, to get more, a lot more uh, contracts uh, later on. Say that uh, yeah. if they are locking in a special relationship with the government, then they, you know, blocking entry from uh, outsiders. Right, right. So the, so the big num basic numbers are among the 8,000 firms, only 15% of them have had at least one contract which means that the contracts are very concentrated among sort of a, a fairly small share of the firms. Now, conditionally, you have one contract, you tend to have sort of about 10 contracts over the course of 10, uh, five to 10 years. So that's why, you know, uh, maybe sort of when you, when you think about the magnitude, we, the, the cleanest identification for us is look at the first contract, but the overall magnitude, the, the, the increase in, for example, a six, a six government uh, uh, software is not coming from one contract. It oftentimes it's coming from cumulative contracts that the firm received over the course of the year. But then, of course, the, your second contract you receive is going to be endogenous to how well you perform in your first contract. So, so we only identify out of the first contract, but, but there's going to be, think about this as on average 10 contracts coming after 
the first contract within the first five years, this firm received this first contract. Okay. All right. So, so for the last four minutes or so, let me quickly go through uh, a, 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 the macro framework and try to put some sort of interpretation on what we learned here. Now, what I hopefully sort of convince you is that there does seem to be quite sort of consistent evidence of the existence of economic scope of scope at the micro firm level. Now, this does not immediately mean that this is going to aggregate, to, uh, aggregate up to the macro level, where if the government pr uh, provides data to all the firms, we're going to see more innovation across the board. And also, this does not immediately mean that this is something that's more, that's desirable. The, the, the welfare implication of government provision of, of, of data is going to be complicated. Okay, so so part of the part of the sort of welfare complication, which 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 will highlight uh, in, in the paper, is that you know, innovation could crowd out resources from consumption. Uh, you know, the, the, the citizen might have uh, direct preferences against civilians uh, or data collection, which would then further complicate uh, the, the welfare implication. Okay, so to to to, to examine sort of the macro uh, economic implications of government data production uh, uh, provision, we would build in the paper a direct data collection change model, uh, sort of built on the Asimogu, uh framework, uh, and and we would sort of. Uh, Build onto this model sort of two important ingredients. That is, the, the firms can use data to produce uh, uh, sort of outputs. So the, 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 the economy is data intensive. And uh, there's going to be two sources of data sets, uh, the, the, the government data and the, and the, and the pri private data, uh, as we see in the, in the, in the, in the uh, micro uh, evidence. Okay. So let me quickly, uh, sorry, I'm skipping a lot given the, given the time, but, but if you're interested, you can, uh, you can look through the, the proof in the paper. But the punchline here is that in, indeed, you can, this can aggregate up. So which means that you know, when a firm, when a government produces uh, or provides more data to the entire economy, it will actually, under very weak conditions, it will generate more growth to the entire economy and it will bias the entire economy towards the more private sector innovation in the data intensive sector. And this is not trivial because it's not just sort of biasing the, the innovation, both private uh, and, 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 and public innovation to the, to the data intensive sector. This is coming from also the, the bias coming from the private sector uh, in, uh, innovation. Okay. The, this does not, however, this aggregation to the macro level from the micro evidence does not immediately mean that this is something that's welfare uh, and ambiguous. That's because sort of maximizing growth is not particularly uh, necessarily the thing that the benevolent state wants to maximize. It should maximize welfare. And welfare coming from consumption can actually be offset by the growth for two different sources. Innovation can crowd out final goods from consumption directly. And government civilian spending and production could also crowd out innovation from other sources in which then could finally produce, uh, crowding out consumption. Okay, so these two actually might, uh, might, might generate more crowding out and, and, and lower welfare. Uh, than, 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 than less government data provision. So, so using the, the economy scope uh, parameter that we estimated from the, from the micro side, we can, we can sort of uh, uh, calibrate the model to show that sort of, you know, there's actually indeed a, a, a range in which the growth effect is dominated, that the increasing government data provision up onto a certain threshold in this particular calibration is going to be 0 0 0.2 in the government spending share in the whole economy uh, in terms of the government data. Uh, uh, sector, the growth effect will dominate. Increasing more data provision is going to increase more welfare. But after that threshold, uh, it, it will generate more more crowd out, where 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 consumption will be crowding out, and and then the innovation coming from the uh, coming from the data intensive sector will also crowd out sort of intermediaries and others using for consumption. Okay. Now to to link back to to what sort of Mike was in the, uh, sort of his first question is that. This has some sort of uh, resemblance to the to the Barrow 1990 model, where one would think about government's sort of data provision is similar to government's goods provision that can generate economies of scale, such as sort of or increase from productivity, such as providing infrastructure to the firm. But in a data intensive economy, instead of building roads that can benefit all firms, providing a large amount of data to all firms can be very beneficial to the overall firm productivity because of the because of the economy of scope that this firm can use the same data to produce other uh, other goods. Okay. So I unfortunately I won't have sort of uh, time uh, too much time left. So so let me actually end here uh, with 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 one final sort of note about 
sort of linking this to, to how we're thinking about sort of autocracy and civilian states and, 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 and the civilian states sort of uh, relationship with the data intensive sector. What we show in this paper is that there's actually an alignment between the, state, the, the, the autocracy and the data intensive innovation. Uh, and sort of greater purchases of the civilian goods not only increases the state's political control potentially because of public security and political stability, but also produces government data that can fuel data intensive innovation. This results also show that the civilian state's preferences for monitoring and controlling for the population may result in an inherent advantage in data intensive innovation that could bias the entire economy to be growing faster and, and biasing more towards the data intensive sector. This is conquering to the, to the existing literature oftentimes to say that there is a autocracy tax on innovation and the frictions in innovation, but rather th this is showing that in, in, in this particular sector, when the, that input has large economies of scope, it can actually generate more a, a competitive advantage for, for, for the economy, uh, for, the, for, the, for the regime where, where the government has control over a lot of data. Okay. But I, I also do want to sort of emphasize that sort of the, the, the welfare implication is going to be complicated uh, partially, not only because it could crowd out consumption, but also because the, the state's uh, sort of objective may not align with the citizen's ob objective. The citizens may uh, deter sort of civilians and data collection, which then the, the, the faster growth and then the more data intensive innovation could actually be detrimental to the citizens' welfare overall. Okay, all right, thank you so much for, for your attention. All right, uh, thanks, David. So because of time constraint, I've, I haven't really taken that many questions from the general audience. If the panelists allow me, you know, let me just use the rest of the break of time, just prioritize the, the attendees, you know, who, who's not on the panel. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. I'm going to unmute you and ask the questions. Then if we have time left, I'm going to still come back to the panelists. For, uh, for both of the earlier two papers, in fact, you know, since we didn't have the break for the first paper. Um, I didn't see anyone raise your hand, you know, but just to feel free, you know, if you want to type anything in the Q&A or uh, raise your hand. Uh, okay, if we have no question from our general attendee, you know, please, you know, panelists, you, you should feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask any question. Can I ask uh, another question uh, uh, about David's uh, this paper? So, um, so I think it's very hard to know what will be the counterfactual. Say that uh, if we, if uh, if there's no such uh, procurement, uh, what will happen to 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 these uh, AI firms? So, but one 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 plausible way to to check that is to see if in a province or a city with lots of uh, contracts offered to AI firms, whether or not this kind of thing will uh, will be co correlated with the firm entry, especially look at, you know, Tian Yan Cha data, right? Say that uh, if, uh, say, uh, if a firm in a region gets a lot of contracts from, 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 from the local government, would that kind of uh, uh, reduce the incentive for, for uh, uh, entrance in that city? Just to think about the uh, you know potential downside of uh, of uh, this uh, this government data channel, I think that's uh, that can be seen in the data, right? Yeah, yeah. So 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 sort of a class of sort of uh, empirical things we haven't sort of really dug into to to, to explore. Uh, one is sort of do, uh, sort of at the firm entry and exit level, do we see more or less of that after a firm's contract? And also sort of the entire market structure of Oftentimes, these firms are not monopolizing particular government data. The, the, the sort of you know, Xinjiang's local police are, are working with three AI firms simultaneously, uh, sort of sequentially, oftentimes. Uh, and so these three firms are potentially having sort of the full access to the, the, the entire data sets for the, for the, for the whole uh, police department in that particular sort of province. Uh, as three firms have access into them together, it's diminishing the value and, and, and output versus uh, some provinces tend to have working with just one firm or some prefecture or only working with one firm. So, so these are sort of uh, super interesting things that we're looking to uh, at the moment, but, uh, but the, in this paper sort of we, we purposely 
sort of shut down sort of from entry from exiting and abstract away from the the the, the market structure part and, and to look at the balance panel then you can sort of more clean to see for a firm that had always been existing after a contract uh does the firm's uh, um, uh output has increased uh, so yeah